Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. This is Fred Starr from the Central Asia Caucasus Institute in Washington. And we have today a remarkable uh, a group of uh, young men and women who have made a real name for themselves in the sphere of business in Tajikistan. Now, let's admit it, most of our reporting in the broader world on Tajikistan <clears throat> it's been focused on its border with Afghanistan, on presidential politics, uh, and, and on the geopolitics of the region as a whole. This tends to be rather superficial and negative, and what it misses, of course, is the economy. And rather than having substantial reports on that subject, we are instead getting impressions gained from people sitting in remote capitals around the world and uh, trying to get the picture from uh, the data published on the internet. However, we're fortunate to have today four men and women who have been at the front lines of, of the economy in Tajikistan and who know it personally and professionally uh, because they're, they're deeply involved. Um, and we're going to hear their personal stories as well as their larger in impressions on on the economy as a whole. And we're we're going to we're going to have time after their initial presentations for to welcome discussion among them and from you, the audience. Uh, we're going to start with. Uh, we will let me introduce first Faruza Rahimova as a National Program Officer for External Relations at the Swiss Cooperation Office in Tajikistan. Previously, she was Executive Director of the American Chamber of Commerce in Tajikistan. We have also Azod Davlatshoya, CEO of T-Cell, which is the largest mobile and broadband operator in Tajikistan and founder an executive board member of Accelerate Prosperity, which is a business accelerator uh, of the AKDN operating in Tajikistan, Kyrgyz Republic, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. He is an entrepreneur and Harvard Business School fellow. Abdullah Karbanov is the co-founder of Alif, a bank that started in Tajikistan, expanded to Uzbekistan three year, years ago, and is currently expanding to other regions. And finally, Farouk Sultanov is head of the country office of International Finance Corporation in Tajikistan. Prior to joining IFC, he held managing positions in Tajikistan and Norway uh, and was involved with faith, uh, consulting firms in both places. We are going to start with Farouk Sultanov. I want to mention that all four of our speakers are fellows, uh, former fellows of the uh, Rumsfeld Foundation's program uh, jointly with the, uh, a with the Central Asia Caucasus Institute. They are all members, active members of CAMCA, as you know, the organization founded by uh, veterans of that program, the, the Rumsfeld, Rumsfeld Fellowship Program. So we're honored to have them all. Let's turn to Farouk Sultanov. Hello, uh, do you hear me? Yes. Good, thanks. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to you, uh, Dr. Stark, to distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, my, uh, my, my, my co-panelists today. Uh, we will have a, this presentation for about 30, 35 minutes, and it will start from the general overview of macroeconomic situation in Tajikistan. Then the floor will be given to uh, Ozod Davlatshoyev, who will be talking about uh, business environment in general, key opportunities, key, uh, key risks that we have here and, uh, and challenges that we face. Then uh, we will go deeper into one of the sectors, one of the promising sectors in Tajikistan, which is the banking sector in FinTech, uh, where uh, Abdullah Kurwanov will uh, talk about what are um, strong and, and weak parts of that sector. And uh, he will also describe his own path and his own story of how they built uh, Alif. And uh, knowing that uh, none of this could happen without the human uh, 
uh, being uh, and human capital, uh, we will ask uh, Firuza to describe what, what what is happening in the uh, and uh, human uh, uh, in the human capital. Sorry, in Tajikistan, or on the on the basis of uh, her experience with the secondary education. And then uh, we'll conclude this presentation and we'll, we'll leave floor for uh, question and answers. So uh, looking at Tajikistan, uh, we see that for the last uh, 10 years, Tajikistan has enjoyed uh, steady economic growth. In, in, in general, it was around six and 7%. It slightly decreased because of the COVID pandemic situation in, in, 19, in, in uh, 2020. And then now it's recovering. So if you think about the main drivers of growth, uh, uh, historically, it used to be agriculture, uh, followed by uh, services and uh, then um, industry and construction. But then for the last two, three years, we see that the, uh, 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 this trend is, is changing and the main driver of uh, economy is uh, now uh, industry followed by construction and then agricultural services. Uh, you, you see that uh, in the uh, first half of 2021, uh, at least government believes that the growth will be 8.7% and the international financial institutions uh, have a consensus about 67% of growth, which is still considerable. Next slide, please. Uh, we are also enjoying a positive uh, current account balance, which is uh, for the first time for the last 10 years. Uh, the last two uh, years we have uh, uh, export basically exceeding our import and uh, IFIs believe that that path that trend will continue to be although a bit moderate uh, somewhere around two to four percent but in general it's a good sign that uh, government's uh, policy on uh, import substitution mainly and export orientation is working and we can name several um, several sectors like uh, production of uh, cement production of uh, gold uh, mining that drives that uh, growth. And uh, you, you probably aware that Tajikistan is, uh, along with the Kyrgyzstan, is uh, one of the uh, uh, main countries that uh, benefit from the large remittances. And to some extent that uh, flow, re flow of remittances is uh, sort of a Dutch disease for us. Uh, and we also see that the uh, uh, ratio of uh, remittances flow into Tajikistan has, has been increasing for the last uh, five years. So uh, in, in its peak, it used to be 45% to GDP. Now it's somewhere around 27, 28%, which is uh, from my personal point of view, it's a good sign. Next slide, please. Although uh, there are a lot of things happening, a lot of positive things happening in Tajikistan. Uh, we, for instance, we were uh, an, an, uh, three times we were counted as a top reformers in doing business report. Uh, we uh, have uh, beautiful laws that uh, were adopted recently with regards to uh, development of the private sector and uh, welcoming the foreign investors. The situation is not that, um, I would say, uh, as not, not that good as expected so far. We believe that that situation will, might, be hap uh, might be changing because of the adoption, for instance, a new tax code, which is more pro-business. Uh, this time and uh, that tax code will be adopted. It's actually adopted and it will be uh, in effect. It is in, it's effective already as of January 1st, 2022. And, but if you look at what is happening now, uh, we see that uh, uh, almost two of the thirds of uh, in, uh, foreign, invest, foreign direct investments are going exclusively into the mining sector and hence the, the growth of the industry production here in Tajikistan. And then uh, that is followed by transport and construction at six, seven percent. Uh, if you look to a number of uh, countries uh, which are investing into Tajikistan uh, historically, and um, historically we see that China is number one, and it's not only the case of Tajikistan, but the countries around us, and perhaps the uh, globe in general as well. And then uh, it's followed by Russian Federation, Turkey, Kazakhstan. And during the last uh, few years, we also see uh, uh, some interest from the Uzbek businesses in Tajikistan. Next slide, please. Yeah, on this slide, I would like to give a floor to my um, um, fellow, to my colleague, fellow uh, Ozot Avlatshoev, who will be talking about investment opportunities in Tajikistan. Over to you, Ozot Horn, please. Thank you. Uh, the Dr. Sar 
fellow uh, friends, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to be here tonight with you. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about um, beyond, you know, what, what can be the opportunity in this country beyond, the, if you call the larger projects. You know, and the larger projects tend to have a bit more of a political support and, you know, may get some incentives. But I, 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 I really want to focus on some of what we call as SGB business or small and growing businesses, which I believe can be the backbone of economy. And they are the one who can create more stable uh, jobs and especially for the youth that is uh, upcoming. Generally, the country uh, is a very young population and growing. Uh, so you, you really need to cater for uh, today's uh, young uh, for, uh, for, for some jobs. So uh, back in 2016, uh, uh, I have uh, set up uh, with the help of the Aga Khan Foundation and for Aga Khan Development Network, a business accelerator, which is a full fledged uh, um, uh, business accelerator. So can, can we go to the next slide, please? And uh, the whole um, idea behind the accelerator was there was a missing gap between uh, a, what you call is microfinance and large business. And that was um, uh, driven also by some of the, if you like, uh, market failures of, you know, providing cheaper financing, uh, quality mentorship. And um, in my personal personal experience, I, 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 I failed at getting uh, what you call is seed capital to some of my entrepreneurial activities. So I thought that could be a, a program which can help the startups. Uh, and I always ironically say, given the lack of uh, diversity of financial instruments or any other kind of support, any other business is effectively a startup, uh, you know, by, by, by beginning of the next year. So uh, with that in mind, uh, uh, we help support that um, a business incubator or accelerator called Excite Prosperity. And the, the real target was into how do we bring the world uh, class mentorship and uh, bridging uh, technical aid or technical assistance with some seed financing or uh, uh, backing a credible project vis-a-vis -vis the bank so that, you know, so that these projects get um, uh, financed. So, and then the whole idea is to uh, not only to grow the middle class, but to actually invest in entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs. Because what we believe at Accelerate Prosperity is that, you know, uh, businesses may fail, but if you have the right kind of entrepreneur and you bet on the right kind of entrepreneur, he's the one who will move from one business to another and he will make it work. So the idea of Accelerate Prosperity is not so much to be the, you know, the, 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 the vetting of any good or bad business. It is really to help the entrepreneur to find the, the right mix of uh, mentorship, financing, ideation, and, 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 and even uh, space for him to be able to materialize his ideas. And we also believe that Accelerate Prosperity is, that is more about, um, uh, more about, um, uh, what you call is the, um, uh, <clears throat> the, the the people's ability to look into uh, problems and challenges that we have a lot of them, and convert them into the opportunities rather than you know um, just just thinking these are the problems we can't solve. So uh, this is the idea of uh, accelerate prosperity business. Uh, next, please, please. And I think one of the key challenges we found out on, 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 on this journey uh, since 2006 is that it's very difficult to really change the legacy in mindset. You have uh, some uh, semi-ready uh, semi or not ready Soviet area uh, industries uh, or factories that are almost um, uh, cumbersome to, to change or to invest in, and you're better off to make um, a, you know, a completely new uh, business uh, from start rather than trying to fix um, these uh, legacies. And then also there is this idea of uh, some, um, you know, what you call is the risk averseness, you know, uh, kids are trained to really uh, get a job rather than looking into becoming entrepreneur or self-employment and very difficult to get people, you know, youngsters into going into, you know, into ventures. 
And obviously the legacy of old way of doing business, you know, they, they are uh, inefficient, the bulky factories, costly production, and uh, complete, la you know, lack of lean and agile business models. So that, that, and then also we've inherited a lot of cumbersome financial institutions that are uh, rather to support the business and help the business, they are more of a uh, penalizing the business. Therefore, uh, you know, there's lack of trust in some of these uh, uh, financial institutions. And then, uh, you know, obviously we have made some improvement as Farouk said, but, you know, we, we, we are still, uh, you know, there's a lot of room to improve on the global ranking of ease of doing business. I think every five, six years, there is, um, uh, you know, th there is this positive trend towards that. Uh, it used to be high cost of starting a new business. Hence, you know, you are seeing more and more business incubators coming out uh, um, and uh, accelerate prosperity being one. Uh, obviously, being uh, totally dependent on a lot of exports and remittances, uh, the, uh, the foreign exchange regimes, and sometimes even the unpredictability of uh, tax mechanisms are uh, also kind of preventing people from going into ventures. There is a complete uh, mis mismanagement and lack of data, whether it's for the sake of um, uh, forecasting or for the sake of analytics. Uh, the statistics are, uh, you know, there's, there's a sometimes large deviation from the real life. So uh, obviously very difficult to, to do business modeling. And obviously, up until recently, there's a very weak piece of digitalization in these environments, which also doesn't help people, you know, get, a, if you like, a leapfrog into a better business. And then uh, also, uh, the, 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 you know, transport and logistics are getting better. Research and development is still, uh, you know, at a very infant level. Data services and things like that are almost an existing uh, investment funds are just coming up in one shape or form. I, IT infrastructure is rather rather good. Um, as and as I said, financial services, corporate legal services, and uh, diversity of banking and financial services are um, also uh, scarce. But obviously, that I think is a a, a big opportunity. To uh, all of these challenges, I think are a big opportunity to, to, to look at and invest in. Next slide, please. So, if I were to use the accelerated prosperity uh, ethos and convert all of these challenges we have faced into opportunities, you have definitely a big opportunity in the ICT uh, sector. This is coming in a big way. Uh, people are adopting it, uh, government is really uh, listening to the sector and uh, so and so that, for example, in Tajikistan, they, 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 in the recent speech of the president, annual speech, he had uh, indicated that the government is developing its own policy on artificial intelligence, which I think uh, calls for, a, uh, you know, for, if you like, a, a, a specific attention to this. Financial services and fintech are also emerging. Uh, you will hopefully see a, a, a wonderful case as, uh, study very soon after that. And uh, there's a big, big uh, uh, opportunity in this region and especially in this country on adventure, eco-tourism, fitness tourism, culture tourism, um, because you know there's a lot of it. There's mountains, there's history, there is uh, you know rather clean ecology. And you know it, it goes from mountains to deserts to snow to everything, so you can have a lot of adventure tourism. Unfortunately, with the COVID and everything, a lot of that was distorted. But uh, that is a huge opportunity for this region. And then, by, based on that, high value horticulture, minerals and gems. Uh, these countries are known for one of the richest uh, uh, geology and metallurgy uh, probably in the world. And definitely that sector will continue to attract a lot of attention, starting from handicraft all the way to, you know, complex met metallurgy in the Zarafshan plus the uh, valley. Uh, and then, you know, if you, if you monetize or rather capitalize on the, uh, on the um, experience of these countries being together, regional trade transport uh, are still a big opportunity. And uh, as I said, we are seeing a lot of attention uh, coming to uh, more virtual and data businesses, be it uh, machine learning or artificial intelligence. At least Tajikistan is uh, 
clearly focusing on those uh, areas of development. Um, so I think uh, that th there are opportunities for looking at the regional investment fund. There are opportunities to look at, at uh, green technology fund. There are uh, opportunities at looking at, uh, you know, um, as I said, machine learning and data. Because you know, when you combine uh, Central Asia alone, you're talking about a market of 140 million, give or take, uh, market, and that's uh, that's pretty big data. Uh, so I think uh, that, that could be something um, uh, quite valuable in terms of a particularly tailor-made uh, fund, investment funds. And uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, apart from the fact that the whole world is now all about uh, green technologies and zero emissions, uh, these countries are, have probably excelled to an, point, to, to, to an extent because they have not been heavily industrialized. Therefore, they can probably gain a momentum of being more greener economies, uh, therefore, be it a policy or an investment fund could be tailor-made for these regions. And then I think there are more and more institutions uh, expressing interest in these areas, uh, be it on R&D type, whether it's climate change or strategic alliances. I think uh, there, there's got to be a lot of partnerships with educational institutions, research and development fund, uh, uh, you know, specific funds for, um, for environment, uh, which could uh, also partner in developing, uh, uh, if you like, enabling environment for new business opportunities. But this is coming in a big way. For example, uh, electric vehicles, um, given that uh, Tajikistan is purely hydropower, uh, it, could, it could completely subsidize import of car carbons um, into, uh, into the country and completely move into electric vehicles. And uh, as we know, electric vehicles are becoming more affordable, the systems are becoming more smart, and therefore this is something that I think these countries should definitely consider as, as, as a major leap in the uh, infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. So I think uh, we used to look at uh, business as, uh, or, you know, or an investment opportunity as um, as, uh, as silos. You know, you you could look at just one one business or a, or 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 a very linked uh, value chain. But now we see the dynamics that you know there is more of an ecosystem type of approach, where, uh, for example, you could uh, invest in fintech and that opens up uh, new platforms of investments. Um, whether you talk about energy and that creates new incentive for green technologies and electric vehicles and stuff like that. So I think uh, the, uh, the, the approach and the, uh, the, the um, specifics of investment, investing in these regions is becoming a bit more of an ecosystem uh, approach rather than silo investments, at least on the small and medium size and small and growing size businesses. And that's a, that's a defining moment, I think, uh, because uh, you're, by investing in ecosystem, uh, you're actually creating more value in the economy, more markets, and obviously more, um, more um, dividends um, in years to come. Uh, next slide, please. And I think we are seeing a lot of uh, momentum in terms of, as I mentioned earlier in my, in my presentation, uh, there's, a, there's a very young country, uh, and I think, uh, 25 years ago, some of the youngsters have managed to go out and, you know, study in Russia and elsewhere in the world. And now I think they've come back and uh, they are really hungry to start uh, businesses. We are seeing uh, some, uh, some really brave uh, intervention by 20, 25 years old people who wants to start their businesses. So we call it, uh, these investments are now literally in the future. And uh, you're talking about at least a 15, 20 year span of uh, investing in people, because it also has a downside to it, which I think my fellows will cover is that uh, without creating these uh, more sustainable, uh, adventurous, if you like, jobs and secure jobs uh, and not uh, being able to create that environment, we're seeing uh, as, as of now, a lot of the brain rain into the neighboring countries and into Russia, especially high skill, including IT and coders and programmers, either they move into a freelance world or they move into some, uh, you know, more, more um, attractive markets. 
Therefore, if we don't invest in these environments and in this, if you like, age, uh, I think we will still continue to struggle with providing the human capital for all these um, for all of these opportunities that we have just indicated. So this was a very broad overview as to you know what we have found out through Accelerate Prosperity's intervention, and uh, in the uh, four five years of its its its, its um, existence. This is the uh, uh, patterns that we are, we are seeing. And uh, I think uh, we are seeing an appetite in investments into these projects. We're seeing government's appetite into making reforms. The new tax code has been uh, uh, applied, uh, which is meant to be more pro-business. Uh, but there are still deficiencies in the market, market failures that could be actually a big opportunity. One of them, one of them is, um, uh, fintech and uh, branches banking and uh, that takes me the privilege to give the floor to my colleague and fellow Abdullah who will talk exactly about that. Thank you very much. Okay, so, uh, hello dear fellows, dear friends. Um, I'll talk briefly about the opportunities uh, in the banking and the fintech sector as well as uh, the challenges. Uh, first of all, uh, the banking laws uh, in Tajikistan are quite good, are actually surprisingly good. Uh, we have had the privilege of traveling to a number of Kamka and uh, non-Kamka countries recently and analyzing the banking sectors there. Comparing to the banking laws uh, we saw there, the banking laws in Tajikistan allow for an MVP approach, a minimum viable product approach, uh, because the capital requirements are much lower and there are a number of licenses that one could start with. Uh, secondly, the regulator is quite open uh, and quite reachable. The statistics that uh, they publish on the central bank's website are quite informative. It's very easy to get in touch uh, with the central bank to appoint a meeting. And we have a law of 30 days uh, for the government entity to respond to any letter that they receive. Uh, and I was actually also quite surprised to find out that not many countries have this law. Uh, we do, and I think it's quite good. Uh, at least you know that uh, you will not be ignored. Uh, and if you're ignored, you can file complaints and these complaints will matter. Now, the challenges, uh, the, the, the number one challenge is that uh, Tajikistan is a very, very small market. Uh, the entire banking sector asset size is about $2 billion. Uh, and there are banks in some other small uh, populations wise, you know, smaller, Kamka countries, where a single bank has more assets than the entire banking sector of Tajikistan. And I've given a couple examples there on the slide. Um, and secondly, uh, more challenging than that is that uh, outside of banking uh, and uh, as a financial institution, as a startup, we'll deal with uh, many regulators. Outside of banking, the laws are not evenly implemented. Uh, there are some obsolete laws. Uh, there are laws that are not clear and can be interpreted in many different ways. Uh, so that makes it quite challenging to operate. So uh, based on these factors, we say sometimes to each other uh, that, uh, and we borrow a phrase there, uh, if you can make it here, you can make it pretty much anywhere. Right? Um, and, uh, and, and we have been fortunate. We have been fortunate to, to be able to, uh, you know, start in Tajikistan. And, and those, you know, those challenges have given us a very, very, very good training. Uh, so we started in 2014 uh, as, as a micro credit organization, one of those licenses that the central bank provide. And over time we've grown significantly. We started with two full-time to part-time people. Now we, we have about 900 people working in Tajikistan, in Uzbekistan. We made a soft launch to Russia. We're entering new countries now. Uh, we provide uh, retail financial products. So our you know, uh, the essential product is Alif Mopi, and we generate revenue from three key drivers. That's buy now, pay later, payments and P2P and remittances. Uh, and we are clear leaders in, in our market. So in Tajikistan, we have more than 95% of the market in BMPL, for example. In Uzbekistan, according to our data, we have about 35% of the market, and we are the leaders there as well. Um, in December, our run rate for revenue was about $34 million, and we did about $111 million in gross merchandise value last year. Uh, we pretty much built our entire banking technology stack from the core banking system to the client relationship management software to mobile, you know, wallet, the processing and, and, and so forth. 
Uh, we signed a strategic partnership with Visa uh, in 2020. Uh, back then, it was the only one in the entire Central Asian region among the commercial banks. Uh, launched the cards last year. That's growing well as well. Uh, and we've had zero churn in our top management, about 30 people now since our founding. So uh, we did a good uh, round last year, uh, valuing Alif at 100 million valuation. We raised $8 million in equity, $50 million in debt. And right now, the shares of the company are trading it at about uh, $200 million uh, in the secondary market. Uh, so uh, that's that's uh, you know that you know that's something we feel very fortunate, privileged about. And um, th this whole journey uh, wouldn't have been possible with, without Kamka Fellows. Um, in, in Uzbekistan, we got a lot of support from Kamka Fellows. Actually, you know, uh, if we talk about Alif leadership, uh, out of the four of us who are involved mostly in operations, you know, two are Kamka Fellows, myself, Zulsho. Zulsho is based in Uzbekistan. He moved there three years ago. And, you know, he, he pretty much started Alif from scratch there and we had a lot of support uh, from Uzbek fellows, uh, to which we are very thankful. Uh, we also also have uh, a third Kamka fellow as well on our board, uh, Javik Swamunbekov, very supportive as well. Although he's not involved day to day in operations, but we're very fortunate to have him. So uh, that's pretty much Ali's story, um, and um, it's you know it's it's been a blessing for us. And I'd be happy to answer any questions later in the Q and A with. That I'll pass the mic to Firuza Rahimova. Uh, please, Apa Firuza, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Starr, dear fellows. I'm so happy to be here. And uh, as mentioned by Dr. Starr, we are all talking about things which are very close for us. And uh, being uh, the daughter of the dynasty of teachers and uh, being the mom of school children, so this is exactly the topic which I would like to talk and. Of course, uh, all the moments described by Farouk, Ozot, and uh, Abdullah, uh, growing economy, opportunities to invest in fintech and other sectors, they need solid human capital. And uh, without education, kind of the basics of human capital development, it would be really challenging. And uh, talking about, in general, about education system of uh, the country, I'll bring just some numbers that uh, we have uh, the preschool education, which covers for the time being 95,000 uh, children. Uh, we have the secondary layer, which covers more than 2.1 million children. And uh, we have uh, <clears throat> TVET structure, which covers less about 60,000. And uh, uh, so technical vocational education system. And we have uh, universities and institutes with only 200,000 uh, students there. So uh, from the experience and observations we have here, we understand that the whole sector of uh, human develop development, especially education faces challenges and problems. And uh, I will focus on some of them. And uh, the one of the problems which uh, face now, it's a growing population. And I have mentioned this 2.1 million school children in this system, and uh, they are served by infrastructure. They are served by capital investments. They are served by human investments. And uh, apparently we still have a shortage of qualified staff. And uh, talking just for comparison with some ratio, uh, I would say that, uh, even if it's three years old data still available. Uh, for example, for Uzbekistan, ratio of teachers covering school children is 21.5. And for Tajikistan, this ratio is 22.3. And talking about global ratio, so it's 21.6. So we will see that uh, the growing number of population uh, and uh, requires a lot of funding and uh, looking at the state budget from uh, the state budget, which is 14% given to social sector, six around 40% is going for education, but it's again mostly to hardware, as mentioned, due to some other facts. So uh, this also causes some uneven distribution of resources. So here we mean financial resources, infrastructure, its equipment and teachers. And uh, of course, cities are more developed than rural area. And whereas 
about 70% of population lives in rural area. So this is just one part of the system, but talking about secondary education, now it seems to be the most flexible, uh, the most interested uh, sector, which tries to respond to modern opportunities, to modern trends, like uh, uh, more focus on FinTech, more fo focus on online uh, teaching classes and methodologies. So these people who gathered and created the kind of group of private schooling in Tajikistan, they are very open for novelties. So uh, the first private school was opened 25 years ago. And we already, as uh, <clears throat> Ozot mentioned, we already start to yield this harvest with all people who graduated, children graduated, coming back and starting to create some new ideas and adopt to new realities and trends in the global economy. Uh, another important point for us, and it's a great opportunity, it's the openness of a regulator. So we are open to create, I mean, the Ministry of Education and Science is open to create new schools, private schools, and it's open to introduce new curricula based on international standards. And uh, talking about another opportunity, of course, it's again growing population, giving uh, fit for thoughts, giving fit for further financing and uh, further development of the private schooling. Next slide, please, Abdullah. So I, talking about private schools, which was my focus and number of interviews with principals and directors, uh, it is, uh, would be said that uh, it's still growing market. And it also requires a lot of funding. And uh, from the data of 2020, for the time being, we have 63 private schools and 24 of them are located in Dushanbe, which again, uh, shows the focus in the cities, actually the focus in the places where more resources available uh, from the point of view of funds, from point of view of technologies and people. And uh, just few numbers here shown uh, about tuition fee, which are paid by parents and they're ready. And uh, funding sources come from migration, it comes from business, it comes from like uh, people working in international community. And uh, this is things which are requiring a lot of staff development for teachers and uh, for the schooling system in general. And according to feedback and uh, uh, talks uh, with these people, the directors, they are really want to have kind of the good pool for development uh, of this staff. And uh, they were using this on their own capacity development mechanism, like teaching TOTs, asking for some external resources, and headhunting is also there. Uh, next slide, if possible, Abdullah. And uh, I just want to show some pictures of these modern schools. And uh, once I've been in one of the courses and uh, guru of the evaluation world, Mr. Ray Rist would say, you build a school and so what just a building it doesn't have anything it doesn't have a soul in it so the soul of these schools of these buildings are teachers the staff who walks there and of course children who want to go and uh, talking about all these schools of course we have quite number of uh, good success stories and uh, for last three years at least we had around 400 medalists from uh, different uh, international Olympiads, mostly on science, it's on mass, it's on hippo, it's on different events and even on very famous Russian TV show showing that our children have very good qualities and uh, we have quite qualified staff in schools, but they need more because children are growing and uh, our schools are not enough in the country. So I would say that uh, the whole sector, <clears throat> again, just to mention that the most flexible, the most open, needs more resources to be there. And uh, for this, we need more teachers, more qualified staff, 
in future to create the whole generation of qualified people who would be employed by our colleagues like Ozod and Abdullah, because they need the quality in education and uh, the quality even in behavior of these people. So in general, I would say again, we have schools, but we need to have more qualified and uh, dedicated people. Thank you. Over to you, Farouk. Yes, um, dear friends, dear fellows, thank you very much uh, for your overviews. And uh, the key question now is, what is in the conclusion? What is a nutshell, basically? If you put aside the issues that we have, and uh, let me remind you that we're living in a, a very interesting region where the things can change very fast in a positive way, both in the negative as well. We see the examples of Uzbekistan, for instance, when they grew very fast uh, during the last like five to six years. So what is Tajikistan in a nutshell? Uh, Tajikistan, first of all, is the country with huge resources. And talking about resources, I, can, I cannot start uh, by not saying a few words about the hydro uh, resources. So in total, we have uh, 525 billion kilowatt per, uh, per year of uh, hydro resources, which is, by the way, four times, almost the four times of all consumption of uh, energy resource, electricity resource, uh, electricity in, this, in the Central Asia. Uh, so far, we are producing only uh, 90 billion, only 90 billion, but in uh, five to seven years time, when our uh, mega project will be completed, uh, robot uh, project will be completed, we, we can double that easily. Uh, we are counted as a, as a uh, country, which is on the sixth place by the volume of green energy to be used, to be consumed locally. So we are pretty green as a country. Uh, we, I would say, extremely green on, on the global uh, level. Uh, we have uh, substantial clean water resources, 65% of uh, all water and 45% of all glaciers of Central Asia. Uh, Central Asia are uh, originating in Tajikistan or, or located in Tajikistan. And uh, on the human uh, resources, uh, we see that we have a young, fast growing and literate population. 65% uh, of population is below 35 years old. And we are growing uh, substantially fast. It's the growth rate uh, is something around 1.5 to 2 percent. And what is more important, uh, youth in Tajikistan is eager to learn. And the number of uh, people who are getting uh, the first, second, and third places in uh, in, in this in the different world Olympics, uh, Olympiads, or who are trying to uh, go to study abroad, is is, is increasing in, in in our time when we use it to go. Uh, to school and then to universities and then uh, when we got our master degrees outside of the country the number of people who were willing to go to study was uh, much less so there's a positive positive dynamics and of course uh, talking about the human capital we cannot mention about the uh, uh, young uh, entrepreneurs uh, a new wave entrepreneurs which are appearing in Tajikistan and uh, those those are the heroes who can create uh, new products, who can create new business models, who can test them locally and then start to expand uh, outside of Tajikistan. And there's several proven models. And Alif is one of them. There are several others. Uh, we can name them. <clears throat> and as uh, uh, Abdullah said, uh, if you can make it here, you can make it everywhere. It's, it's, uh, it's like Sparta uh, to, <laughs> to some extent. Yeah, but talking about deposits, uh, Ozot mentioned that we are quite rich, and indeed this is the case. Uh, we are second largest. We have a second largest reserves of uh, antimony in the world, fourth largest of silver. Uh, we are in the top ten countries in the world by uh, by the volume by the reserves of the lead, uh, gold, and we have one of the largest reserves in Central Asia on copper, tungsten, nickel, mercury, and other and other metals and other metals and precious and non precious metals as well. Um, so all that is, is a good basis for future growth. Uh, with the tiny changes in policies, with the uh, more educated people coming back to Tajikistan and working for, for the government, for private sector, for international organizations, I believe that uh, a lot of things can be changed here. And again, I'm, I'm referring to the example of Uzbekistan that, uh, that inspires us to the extent uh, possible. So that's uh, in, in conclusion. Um, we are quite op uh, optimistic about the future of the country. It has everything to grow, 
uh, to grow fast and to take its position uh, in the future, not only in the region, but in the world as well. Thank you very much. That was all from my side. Over to you. Thank you very much. This was a remarkable set of reports and very, very grateful to you all. Uh, I'm sure there are questions that you might want to address to each other and, and let me open the floor to that. And then we'll turn to questions from outside. I have some issues I'd like to raise as well. And any of you want to underscore or seek further information from your partners? We've, uh, we've already spoken a few times, Dr. Starr, so we, we've asked the questions we wanted to ask. <laughs> You've already done so. Okay, let me raise this issue. Uh, very interesting point uh, that's uh, been uh, raised or implied uh, by several of you is the fate of legacy in, uh, enterprises, the, the ones you inherited. Uh, and, and generally, both you've said this explicitly and uh, assumed it, that these basically are not the future, that they, they're not going to be easily transformed. It's better to start over and you've, and you've reported on successful efforts to do so. My question is this, the entire mineral sector and of the energy sector, which are terribly important to Tajikistan, and as you've insisted, will be more so in the future, these are legacies. So what's their future in terms of management, in terms of finance, in terms of overall uh, operational style? I could uh, volunteer to answer um, to the best of my knowledge. Um, I think I, I agree with you, but in a way, uh, at least in this country, from what I know, in the Soviet, um, if you like, ex-Soviet countries, Tajikistan was the least uh, explored in that sense um, when it comes to mining. For example, when you look at the Zarafshan Plast, I think uh, uh, from the reports I read a few years ago, so excuse my, my, my ignorance here, but... Uh, I think it was less than 5% that Tajikistan has tapped into its own resources, which basically means <clears throat> there is no legacy. It's everything on the ground. So it's a high time to actually, you know, attract efficient uh, methodologies, financial instruments, uh, whatever kind of collaterals uh, you could, you could uh, and do proper feasibility studies. So I said that, that uh, from that perspective, we're quite uh, advantageous uh, by, by the fact that it wasn't really touched at all. So uh, uh, when it comes to mining, I would say it's not a legacy. It's something which is un untapped potential. And like I said, this has been six or seven years ago when I read about it. So if I'm ignorant about uh, recent developments, I excuse myself from that. But what about energy? I mean, the hydroelectric field is a, it's a government operation today, is it not? Well, and I mean, it, it, is it going to be able to uh, regenerate itself uh, on the basis of the principles that the group of you embody? No, I think the government has now paid a, a gigantic attention into bringing efficiency to the systems. Like as we speak today, the whole city of Dushanbe is moving into a touchless meters, which are, you know, which are preventing from commercial or technical fraud. It's, uh, it's been making good uh, revenues from exporting that energy to neighboring uh, Afghanistan up until recently. And uh, some of the regions are becoming more efficient in using that resource. So I think there's a lot of attention and investment and good management being put into this, uh, including uh, changes in the governance. So uh, this, is, uh, it's, this is a natural monopoly. So obviously you can't demonopolize it day one. Uh, but uh, by bringing it, uh, you know, private investment into, into two hydropower stations, giving uh, on a concession uh, the whole of Eastern energy to a private group uh, is already, I think, a, a good way of reforming the sector. So I think uh, that particular sector, I think, is uh, probably well ahead of the others, if I may be bold to say. 
So, uh, but I'm definitely seeing, for example, in the eastern part, the concession was given to the uh, Khan Development Network, where today the KPIs in terms of uh, efficiency and usage of energy are close to European. So the losses are uh, much less than they would be in, in any industrial country. And the same uh, efficiency methodology is being applied in the rest of the country. Power stations are being built on BOT or you know private public partnership basis, and uh, there are joint cooperative mechanisms like uh, CASA that Tajikistan has been very proactive uh, in uh, engaging with. So I think there is a, there's a definitely a will and appetite, and it's a, a, to an extent that I know it's uh, returning some dividends by exporting that um, clean power. Thank you very much. Interesting perspective. I we have a question here from uh, Imran Shams, directed to Alif. Will you be the first unicorn of Tajikistan? Uh, how do you respond to that? Um, we hope, of course. Um, that's not the primary goal in itself. Uh, although, um, you know, as as. Uh, our, our long-term vision is, is to hopefully build the uh, global champion in Islamic fintech. One, one thing I didn't mention is that uh, we're trying to do everything we do in, in a Sharia compliant manner to the extent it's possible in the regulations. So our, our long-term vision is, is to build a global champion in Islamic fintech and we're moving uh, slowly to the countries with larger Muslim populations. Uh, and uh, along the way, surely, you know, hopefully we'll have such milestones, including valuation-based milestones. And um, yeah, uh, hope so. <laughs> uh, and I think the rest of the question is what's the likelihood uh, and how do you see the story about trajectory inspiring a huge wave of service in the country? Um, exactly. The, um, I, I think it, it's um, a, a great, uh, it, it's a great, regulatory, especially the banking regulatory infrastructure that we have that allows for companies like Alif uh, to uh, to establish, to work and succeed. Um, and uh, I think that that could indeed, you know, bring about a number of players. Um, I, I, I believe that the banking sector, despite a lot of criticism it receives in Tajikistan, is relatively speaking, compared to other sectors, it's quite vibrant. Uh, and, and compared to other sectors, it attracts more talents and so forth, and it could could bring about a lot of a lot of interesting, you know, uh, startups, players, fintech players, AI players, and and you know technology players, all, all within that you know finance related um, umbrella. So, uh, very much hope so. Let me raise a question about uh, the the. Uh, more modest levels of the economy, the, the, the shops, businesses, and so on, that are operating on the street level. Uh, do, is any of this new mentality that you all embody uh, evident there? Is there, it, it, is there entrepreneurship? And, and above all, what is that meaning for employment? That produced silence. <laughs> yeah, just uh, was wondering, you know, if, if yeah, if, if you were addressing the question to any one of us in particular. Um, uh, okay, Farouk, I, I think you raised your hand there, and I can then add my thoughts as well. Um, yes, um, on 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 a, on a street business, uh, as 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 you mentioned, like restaurants, shops, uh, small producers. What we see that after the COVID uh, hit uh, Tajikistan, we as a, as a many countries around us, we started to go digital. And that's that's the, the, we we feel that and and I see that the, most of the trade either has gone to uh, to websites like Somon TJ, like a uh, few others that we have, and uh, we see that a lot of uh, trade is going on, on on Facebook and on Instagram these days, and uh, that in combination with a, a rise of delivery services has created a, much more opportunities for for smaller businesses here, and uh, I, I believe that uh, that. Uh, this is something that we already tested. We liked it, and we most likely will know uh, will never go back, you know, to the previous modalities that we have here. So that's my answer. That was my answer. Over to you, colleagues, please. 
let me ask you more specifically, is this a, a creating employment? Because the great danger is that you is that you could move forward on these advanced sectors that you all are yeah. engaged in and leaving a big set part, part of the population behind, uh, 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 impoverished, uh, outside the new entrepreneurial world and, and not happy. Yeah. Well, um, there is no particular data on that, uh, that we could rely on, but my feeling is that uh, a start of the business and entrance to the business world uh, became easier and cheaper these days. So you basically can cook stuff at your home and deliver it, you know, or, or instead of having a, a large shop and pay rent, you can keep your stocks at home and, 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 and use the delivery services to distribute your, your, your products. So new models are appearing here. And uh, those models are, are, are much more efficient. And uh, we also see that from, uh, from the statistics that we have on the renting prices for, uh, for, for a property uh, on, on the local shops and local trading malls and bazaars. So it's decreasing. So there is less demand uh, for uh, entrepreneurs to go to shops and bazaars and um, more demand in uh, new uh, methods of, 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 of doing business. Uh, will that create uh, will that create uh, more employment? Eventually, yes, because you will be more efficient. You will be able to keep prices low for your products and services, and, and hence to be more competitive uh, in in the, in the medium and long run. That's my that's my uh, view on that. Interesting question from Susan Elliott. The National Association of Businesswomen of Tajikistan has been one of the biggest commercial organizations in Tajikistan to promote development of women and youth entrepreneurship. Do any of you work with that organization? It seems not. <laughs> Let me turn to the next question. Uh, and that, uh, for banking, uh, Don Van Atta asked, for banking, private education, and many other activities, there appears to be a fairly narrow middle and upper class that your activities can target. You mentioned the need to expand outside of Dushanbe. Could any of you say more about these possibilities? What can be done to expand your market geographically within Tajikistan? <clears throat> um, uh, I, I think Dr. Starr, the previous question was quite a good one, and I, I want to add a few things there, but Apai Firuza, do, do you want to take it first go on that, or? Uh, maybe yes, just to say a couple of words, and actually it's true that uh, what Dr. Starr said, that uh, there is still the big difference between the city area, especially Dushanbe and Hujan, the most developed one, and if you go to rural area, it's a completely different picture and a different story. And of course, this uh, uneven uh, distribution of resources, from other hand, it's logical because it's uh, the kind of the world trend that cities are growing quicker, faster, and uh, uh, it's a concentration of everything in cities. But from other hand, with our population, more than 70% living in rural areas, some efforts are done. There are some success stories on uh, using new te technologies in agriculture, just opening some smaller businesses. Again, it's about smaller businesses. And, and I really hope that uh, what uh, Ozot was talking about, mining and other sectors will develop kind of the infrastructure around these areas and uh, people would get access to more decent job and uh, kind of uh, create new opportunities for people living in this area, which uh, brings more shops, restaurants and trading facilities to uh, the developing industries. That's all from my side, Abdullah, please. Um, thank, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I think, um, Dr. Starr, with, with uh, the earlier question that uh, the one by Ms. Elliott, um, I'm, I'm, you know, while we do not work directly with, with the Women's Association, I, um, I just wanted to mention that in general, we see, especially in the banking sector, um, a, a good trend where some of the, you know, some of the very best run banks are led by women. And that's a very good thing to see as well. Uh, and, and, you know, in Alif, uh, we, we have a lot of women in the leadership, uh, which we take a lot of pride in, especially in, in, in when it comes to IT, for example, the head of IT in Alif for quite a long time initially, you know, was, was uh, a lady. She's, she's done an amazing job setting up the infrastructure. 
uh, the first deputy uh, chairman at Alif uh, is, is a lady, Gulanur Atobek, uh, with a, a very successful, very, uh, you know, uh, strong uh, background leading a, a Deloitte in Tajikistan previously. So um, I think in, in that regard, in Tajikistan overall, we, we, when it comes to leadership positions, or especially in, in the banking, we see, you know, more diversity. Uh, regarding the question about moving to the regions, um, indeed, you know, while most of the businesses tend to focus on, on the couple, one, two, three top cities in, in Tajikistan, that's Dushanbe, Khujand in the north, Bokhtar uh, in the south, uh, it, it, we very, you know, only last year, Alif actually, in our case, we grew to the regions and, and we got, we were surprised. We were surprised by how vibrant they are, how, how, how much demand there is in, in the regions. You know, we opened in, in within, in one year, we opened 11 new cities for, for ourselves. And, 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 and we, we were surprised by how, how much demand actually there is in, in those regions. So I think it's, it's a big untapped potential as well. Very interesting. I, I'm concerned about, uh, uh, educational dimension and pre preparation of your successors. Uh, to what extent does, is Tajikistan building the resources to train not just uh, people in business and finance, but in key tech technology areas? Or is it going to be continue to be heavily dependent on those who've, who've studied abroad. I, I'm well aware, and I have good friends who've been at the National University over many years. I, I, but the question is, back to the issue of legacy institutions, can they transform themselves in a way, in the field of education, in a way that's supportive of your activities? Leave it to you to decide. Uh, maybe just I. Uh, do you hear me, Doctor Star? Can they adapt to the new? Can the legacy educational institutions really adapt to the new? Or, and if not, or, or even if they are, are new institutions coming up that can really serve the new sectors of the economy? Uh, talking about adapting and flexibility, uh, I was talking uh, and uh, touching upon the secondary education, which proves to be flexible and adaptive. And talking to other layers, and uh, I would say more specific and uh, qualified working force, still it's an, an ongoing process. There are some private initiatives, like uh, again in FinTech and artificial intelligence, creating uh, own academia for developing of coding or informatics on that. Actually talking nationwide, new strategy is uh, underway of implementation by the government. And uh, they are really want to move from agriculture to industrialization, which requires a lot of uh, forces and a lot of finance and qualified stuff. So some examples could be like interaction with Russian Federation on uh, different levels of uh, uh, change of knowledge. It's USAID doing a great job and change uh, kind of uh, experience and things. But there are another process which uh, was mentioned by Ozot. It's a brain drain process, which people looking for decent job, they are looking for decent payment and they tend to leave the country. But there is another trend and tendency happens, I would call it kind of the hand drain, that qualified masters, uh, electricians or whoever also leaving the country for better uh, jobs. But here, another uh, kind of uh, jump happened in our economy, it's a construction growth. And these constructions returned many of people to the country back because they earn more or less the same money which is in the construction sites of Russia or Kazakhstan. So there are processes which force these uh, businesses and also institutions to adapt to the system. And uh, I'm pretty sure that the ministry is thinking deeply on how to reform the whole system and the whole sector as you have mentioned, it was a huge legacy 
And actually, it was not bad talking about literacy rate and access to education. And uh, answering to, I think, Mamuka's question, uh, there is a perspective to open universities, but not yet materialized. There are some discussions and there are some negotiations at that level. Thank you. Interesting. Thank, thank you. Um, I'd like to raise a, to, a, a question about two areas that we've only touched on uh, uh, glancingly, and that is uh, um, agriculture and more the, the fairly traditional uh, areas of industry. Um, as, as you've reported, these remain extremely important sectors of the economy. Um, and I just note in the area of, of in my question with regard to the area of, uh, of industry, is this modernization that you're all uh, uh, embodying, is this reflected there as well? Again, it's the question of legacy firms and can they, can they change? And then in agriculture, a slightly different issue. And that is that all your neighbors in Central Asia were very uh, dismissive of agriculture after, after independence and all were going to do the modern sectors, agriculture is passe and all that stuff. And now they're discovering, every one of them, that there is a, an, a new agriculture that is as innovative as those things that you all are doing in your fields. Uh, are you aware of, of any transformation or, or, uh, or uh, reconfiguring re, uh, in agriculture and in, and in traditional industries, or are these just going to uh, uh, lag behind? I guess I could take a, a tour on this one quickly. Uh, I, I think uh, we, uh, I'm Dr. Dr. Starr, you, you're right. We were really uh, focusing on high tech. Thinking is that um, you know whether you can bring a, a digital fintech to an underprivileged. If a person wants to do banking with only fifty dollars, it would be too expensive for him to come to Dushanbe and to do banking. So I think by combining telecoms and fintech, you're re really bringing the banking to the to the to the, to the last mile. But uh, to answer your question, um, uh, yes, there hasn't been uh, uh, th there hasn't been a major leap in this uh, sector, but uh, we're seeing uh, uh, attraction of new technologies. I think in the last uh, five years, uh, a, a lot of um, uh, um, cold storage uh, businesses have been developed. From what I know, uh, people started to invest heavily in uh, what you call is intensive gardening, which ha which have better crops. I think the, 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 the president of the country uh, personally has uh, focused a lot on gardening and on, um, on agriculture, opening up, uh, you know, lots of gardens. And I've also seen uh, a major investments happening, especially in the north, in the what you call is hydro, hydroponic greenhouses with uh, solar power. And I think with COVID, uh, also everybody realized that, you know, there's a uh, a lot of stuff you can grow locally and without going to be uh, dependent on the logistics uh, or whatnot. So uh, it is not as advanced, but uh, definitely people are people are pivoting to better technologies, better use of land, and uh, better planning. And uh, as as we all know, agriculture is becoming also more efficient because of use of technology, be it uh, drip technology or be it as I said, hydroponic hydroponic. Uh, vertical gardening uh, so we have seen we've seen uh, some large projects coming in and i have personally seen interest of uh, neighboring countries uh, kazakhstan from southeast asia who were trying to uh, find um, uh, opportunities to invest in this so i i, I see the momentum but uh, we haven't seen that as significant as uh, maybe by some of the other uh, sectors we've mentioned several of you have made very interesting uh, comments about your uh, activities abroad. Uh, you're, you're extending your your initiatives to to neighboring countries. Uh, I'd like you to uh, reflect on this a little more in the context. You're all veterans of the Comca program. You're all Comca fellows, and and uh, I wonder if you could comment on on the the purely 
purely regional dimension, or is this just one of many sectors that you that you have beyond your borders? The question to me or to everybody? Who, any of you? Dive in. I have been so focused on um, telecoms and uh, AP lately. I kind of become a little bit uh, in, in inwards. But uh, Farouk, do you want to take a lead on this? Because you do some regional stuff. Where of of any discussion, whether initiated in the private sector or by government, about the a, a means of expanding the regional economic interaction. Um, yes, absolutely. Well, uh, lately we were a bit, uh, I would say, uh, post uh, by by the uh, by the things that happened in in, in Kyrgyzstan, then later in uh, Afghanistan and, and in Kazakhstan. However, uh, I see that there are a lot of uh, potential and a lot of discussions going on about the mutual projects. So we in the World Bank Group we initiated Casa One Thousand and Digital Casa at the beginning, and then. Uh, we are still considering a lot of uh, opportunities related to uh, to tourism, to um, to uh, energy supply, and and projects uh, like that. So on bilateral level, we see that the, the Uzbekistan is is continuing to playing a connection role between all the five stands around us. And for instance, on a bilateral level, they have uh, joint projects with with almost every country. With that, for instance, they have agreed to uh, create an investment fund that will be topped up by both governments, you know, to invest in uh, businesses in Tajikistan. On top of that, uh, there was an agreement to uh, collectively build uh, hydropower stations on the, on the neighboring uh, sites of uh, Sukht province, between Sukht province and Samarkand province. There is the uh, Zarafshan River, you know it perfectly, Dr. Star. And uh, so uh, there are several of these kind of projects uh, uh, with a range of uh, five to 100 millions uh, approximately. And uh, I believe the same process are happening with other countries. And in, in general, I see that the, there is a growing interest in, um, uh, in, in investment from uh, Northern uh, countries into the Southern countries and uh, vice versa sometimes. There is even a growing interest of Tajik business in investing in Uzbekistan. And Alif is, in, is not the only example. Uh, in accordance to our data, we uh, have some, somewhere around 150 million US dollars invested by Tajik business in, in Uzbekistan already. So it's a quite, uh, quite a serious numbers. Uh, so yes, there, there are some uh, integration process are going on. Uh, what we really expect is when political situation will stabilize generally in the region. Uh, and I believe that it will, it will give a, a, a more booster effect to, to, to the integration because difficult times shows that uh, a closer neighbor is better than the distant uh, relative. <laughs> Certainly true. Uh, let, let me okay. then speak about your closest neighbor with which you have the longest border, Afghanistan, and with which you have uh, been uh, uh, deeply and profoundly linked for uh, uh, thousands of years. Uh, uh, obviously, this is a relationship that has been dramatically upset in recent months. On the other hand, uh, no country is better positioned to, to, uh, to watch and analyze the situation there. And I'm asking, what are you hearing from purely a business standpoint and, and indeed from an investment standpoint? Now, we know your government has taken a very positive view in pushing ahead with Casa 1000 and pushing ahead with, with transport projects. But beyond that, what are you getting? Um, I can start and then I'll give a floor to my, uh, to my friends. I think uh, if you ask me uh, who, is, uh, who is the Afghan businessman, uh, I can say that it's a very business oriented and very pragmatic person, first of all. And we see that, and when we talk about, uh, about the business with the local uh, businessmen who uh, travel, who uh, export to Afghanistan, they say that not much has changed, frankly speaking, with the change of powers that there. So there is a still a flow of products and services going to, to, to the Afghan side. Uh, same is with, uh, I believe, uh, with, with other countries in the region. I, I saw, I looked up uh, statistics of, uh, of trade 
between Uzbekistan and Afghanistan, uh, between Kazakhstan, between Kyrgyzstan. So there is a positive dynamic. So for instance, in the case of uh, Uzbekistan, it's fourth largest exporter. And in the case of Tajikistan, like 20% of all our export goes to that country. And we are not doing much, frankly speaking. We are not promoting enough uh, uh, our trade with, with our Afghan neighbors. So um, yes, uh, changes are happening. Um, and as, as, as usual, as usual, uh, when changes are happening, there are positive and negative effects. On the trade, uh, it's a bit earlier to say how it will shape up in the medium run, but it seems that uh, business as usual is continuing there. Any other comments on this issue? There being none, let me turn to, to another question and that is directed uh, to, to Farosa, Firoza, and that is, what are the prospects of the private of private universities in Tajikistan, and would people be able to uh, afford to pay for it? Perspectives are there. Uh, according to uh, what I had and uh, what I have discussed with colleagues from this sector, there are some already negotiations uh, for opening the private universities, but still not yet clear when and how and uh, which form will be. But uh, the attempts are there, and uh, I believe that uh, at least a uh, number of universities jointly with other countries like Russian, Tajik universities, and uh, we have this uh, uh, University of Central Asia show that it's there is a big potential to develop this sector as well. And uh, we hope that uh, with new universities, new curricula, new standards come. And uh, we believe that this sector of higher education will adapt more to the growing needs of uh, new markets because we cannot, even if it's agriculture, we still need new people with a new mindset and uh, new experience and knowledge in this regard. So there is a perspective and it will come in some, maybe even months. Well, uh, I would say there's a big difference between being a colonial outpost of a foreign university and having your own institution, which is focused 100% on your needs. But that's another matter. Are there any further questions or issues that you all would like to raise? There being none, uh, let me, Thank Baruza, Baruch, Abdullah, and Azad for what I consider to be most impressive, even remarkable set of presentations. But I'd like to go in conclusion, not try to summarize what they've expressed so very well. And by the way, your, your uh, visual uh, data was, was very, very useful as well. I'd like to address the world business community, people in business world globally. Uh, if you haven't, if you've seen this, share it with your friends. This is as clear and as uplifting a statement, as constructive a statement on the Tajik economy, I think that I've heard or read in, in, in many a year. It's a remarkable set of presentations. Now, yes, foreign business people, foreign journalists, if, they, if, you're, if any of you are watching, share this with your friends. It's, it's a very important statement. But beyond that, how many of Tajikistan's own ambassadors abroad are watching this? They all should see it. This is who you are. Uh, it, it, it's not the fashionable issues of the moment. Th this is these are the real issues, and 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 your and, and you we have here in this presentation highly qualified men and women who can who have spoken to them. So finally, beyond that, I would ask, which at the ministry level in Dushanbe are paying attention to what we've heard today? If you're not, you're failing in your job. This is really the key to the success of the country in the long term. And I would therefore recommend that one of the ministers who might be watching present this uh, a, a, a tape of this, of this uh, or a link to this uh, conversation that we've had here 
uh, of Kamka Fellows uh, 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 present a link of, to this to the president of Tajikistan. This is an extremely important material. Uh, it's valuable, it's timely, and I'm delighted to say it, it's impressively positive. So thank you all once again very much, and I hope all of you to whom I've addressed this final homily will, will pay attention and act on it, share this with many others. Thank you. <laughs>